in mediating protection, protection against, against some, against some infections, infections and preventing, and preventing proper, proper resistance against, against um, intracellular uh, pathogens, pathogens, pathogens like Legionella. Like but, but over the over years, the it years became apparent, became apparent that, that TH2 cells, cells probably played little role as regulatory, regulatory cells, cells in parasitic, parasitic infections. infections. So, so these TH2 cells, TH2 cells that develop in valve mice, mice that produce high levels, high levels of IL-4, um, um, they weren't they found in non-healing non um, cutaneous, cutaneous or visceral, visceral forms of leishmaniel diseases in humans. So, so this, this, this very susceptible non-healing non valve mouse, mouse model, model for leishmania didn't translate, translate to uh, 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 an, immunologic an immunologic understanding, understanding of non-healing non severe, severe forms, forms of leishmaniasis, leishmaniasis in people. In people. Um, um, the polarized, polarized TH2, THQ response in the valve was, was just was not, not observed in, in, in people, people like with like visceral leishmaniasis. leishmaniasis. Um, um, so, so and, and similarly, similarly, the reciprocal, the reciprocal balance, balance of TH1, TH2, TH2 response, response development, development observed in our major infection infections not seen to control resistance and susceptibility in most in other experimental, experimental models, models of parasitic, parasitic bacterial or, or viral, viral infections. infections. This, this very, very reductionist, reductionist simplistic, simplistic notion, notion throughout, throughout the, 90s the 90s that, that they had they solved, had solved you, know, a you know, a mechanistic understanding, understanding of susceptibility, susceptibility and resistance, and resistance to, in, to in, uh, most, um, infectious most infectious diseases, diseases uh, 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 according, according to this, to this th1, 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 th1 th2 paradigm, paradigm that, 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 began that began to uh, uh, unravel, unravel as they as looked they more looked carefully, more carefully uh, um, in, 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 in human, human responses. Response. So, so I'm going to do uh, 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 another discussion, discussion of other T cell, cell subsets, subsets that play, that play important, important regulatory, regulatory roles. roles. Um, and, um, that and that study, study of parasitic, parasitic infections, infections have, have played, have played a, huge, a, huge, a huge part, huge part in playing um, 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 these, um, these other regulatory, regulatory T cells, T -cells, T -cells that, 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 uh, that uh, control, control um, um, the strength, strength and, and, and the, the effector, effector class, class of an immune, immune response. response. Um, 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 and and I'll, focus I'll focus a lot of attention, lot of attention on interleukin, on interleukin 10. 10. So, a, so a, Again, again um, uh, where, 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 where uh, I'm, trying I'm trying to convince, convince you that, you that it was the study of parasitic infections, infections that led us down, down this road to a fuller, fuller understanding, understanding of, 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 of immune, immune regulation, regulation in, 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 in the immune system. Immune system. Um, um, it was, it was IL-10 was, IL was originally identified as a product, product of TH2 clones, clones, clones that, in that inhibit cytokine synthesis by TH1 cells. Um, um, but it was but later, it was shown, later to shown to produce by, by many, many, many different, different lymphoid, lymphoid and myeloid, and myeloid cell, cell types. So, so it's, it's, as, as I'll show you, it's produced, produced by macrophages and dendritic cells. cells. It's produced by virtually, by virtually every, every lymphocyte, lymphocyte subclass, B cells, B cells, B cells, B cells. Um, and, um, and it's demonstrated, it's demonstrated to have broad, broad immunosuppressive immunos properties, properties were shown to be not not uh, uh, acting, acting directly, directly on, on uh, those those um, on, on lymphocytes, lymphocytes, but through, but through its, its down regulation of macrophage, of macrophage and dendritic, and dendritic cell, cell antigen, antigen presenting, presenting function. function. So, so the key, the, key, the, first, the key first key studies, studies were, done were done using, using an IL-10 knockout, knockout mouse. mouse. So, so this, this was in the 90s. This is when they were, when they were first first generating uh, uh, knockout, knockout mice. mice. Um, um, and, and, and targeting, targeting various, various um, interleukins. interleukins. And this was and one this of the first knockout, knockout ma ma mice, mice for, 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 uh, for uh, an interleukin, an interleukin that, was that was targeted. And the prediction, and the prediction was, was if IL-10 IL indeed inhibits TH1 cytokine, cytokine synthesis and, and macrophage effector, effector function, function, then IL-10 IL knockout, knockout mice should be highly resistant, resistant to infection, to infection within intracellular parasites. parasites. So this so work this was done with toxoplasma. with toxoplasma. So, so this is this toxoplasma, toxoplasma is um, um, is a protozoan parasite. parasite. It's one of the it's most successful uh, um, uh, uh, parasitic, parasitic agents, agents because, because it can infect, infect virtually, virtually any host and, and virtually, virtually any nucleated, any nucleated cell, type. cell type. Incredibly, Incredibly successful, successful parasite. parasite. Um, um, and, and immunity, immunity to, it to it is mediated, is mediated by, by a highly TH1 TH polarized, polarized um, um, response, response. Um, um, IL-12 and interferon gamma-dependent gamma dependent half, -life. half -life.
Um, so, uh, so Toxoplasma gondii, gondii would, would, be, would taken be taken up by energy presenting, presenting cells, cells, and we'll and talk we'll more talk about more these, about in, a these bit, in a bit, which would which produce, would produce this, this, this important, important cytokine. cytokine. We'll, we'll talk, talk more about, about IL-12, which, which instructs, instructs TH1 development, development in these different lymphocyte subsets. And that and interferon, that interferon gamma, gamma would then, would then uh, that's, uh, that's produced, would then activate infected cells for killing of toxoplasma. Okay. So, so, so it was a beautiful, was a beautiful mouse, mouse model, model to study, to study uh, uh, cell mediated immunity, immunity and the role of the role TH1 responses, responses in, 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 um, in, in, in host, host resistance, resistance to these, these kinds, kinds of uh, 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 pathogens. So, so sure, sure enough, enough, if you take if you an take interferon gamma, gamma knockout, knockout mouse, mouse, they'll die, they'll die really, really early, of early of infection. Of infection. But then the, then surprise, the surprise was, was that when they when knocked, they knocked out, out IL-10, instead, instead of even of being, being more resistant, resistant they, died they died just, just as quickly. As quickly. So what so did they, what die, did they of? die of? Well, they, well, hardly, they hardly had, had any had parasites. Any parasites. What, they what they died of was a cytokine, was a cytokine storm. storm. It was, it was they died, they died of, of immunopathology, immunopathology um, um, in, in, the in the absence of an important, an important uh, 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 regulator, regulator of, of a TH1, TH1 response. response. So they made, so they huge, made levels huge levels of these of TH1, TH1 cytokines, IL-12 and interferon gamma. gamma. If, you if you looked at, at the liver histopathology, histopathology massive, massive infiltrate, infiltrate of, of inflammatory of cells into the liver, liver. And, and, and they and died of essentially systemic inflammation. So IL-10 so IL protects, protects against, against collateral, collateral tissue, tissue damage, damage mediated, mediated by TH1 cells, cells in, the in, the in the response to protozoan infection. infection. So, so if you if have you a balanced IL-10 and IL-12 or TH1 response, response then, then you can, you can, um, you can you get, get gamma-mediated gamma host, host resistance. resistance. In the, in the absence of this, of this regulatory, regulatory cytokine, cytokine IL-10, IL then, then you have this cytokine storm, an uncontrolled TH1 response. You have you have uh, uh, strong, strong pathogen, pathogen control, control, but 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 uh, uh, gamma dependent, gamma dependent immunopathology. immunopathology. So so this this, this was, was one of the one of the uh, a, a very important, important lesson, lesson about, about immuno uh, the, regulation the regulation of the immune, of the immune system. system. Once, you, once turn you turn a response, a response on, on, once these, once these infectious, infectious agents, agents induce a response, response it's, it's critical, critical to turn them on. Them on. Otherwise, Otherwise, the, the inflammation. inflammation and the immunopathology, and the immunopathology becomes, becomes more threatening, threatening life-threatening, life -threatening than, than the infection, the infection itself. itself. Um, and um, again, and this, again was this was learned, learned uh, initially, uh, initially from these from studies, studies of a parasitic, of a parasitic infection. infection. So, so uh, what, are uh, what are the cellular, cellular sources, sources of immunoregulatory IL-10, and, 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 and how is production of the cytokine stimulated during infection? infection. Um, um, so, so the, the, and, and, and these were these studies were in the in late, late 90s, 90s and the early, the early 2000s. 2000s. Again, Again, in, in parasitic, parasitic uh, infection, uh, infection models, models it these, these were some were of the some first of the studies, studies to demonstrate, to demonstrate that, that these professional, professional suppressor, suppressor cells, cells called, called uh, FOXP3, uh, FOXP3 regulatory, regulatory T cells, T cells um, uh, are, are provide a major, major source of IL-10 and, and, and regulate host response, response to parasites. parasites. These, These are, are cells, cells that function functionally to control, to, control uh, uh, to, to, to maintain, maintain peripheral, peripheral tolerance, tolerance, to make to sure make that sure our cells cell that are lymphocytes that, that, uh, develop that develop in the thymus, in the thymus and get out of the out periphery, the periphery don't, don't uh, produce uh, 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 responses, responses against, against self antigens, antigens autoimmunity. Auto so they're, so critical they're critical for maintaining, for maintaining peripheral, peripheral tolerance. tolerance. As it turns, As it turns out, they're, they're also they're critical, also critical in, dampening, in dampening um, um, in in immune, immune responses, responses that are, are, um, uh, that that are turned, turned on by infection. infection. Um, um, and they, 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 produce they produce these down these regulatory, down regulatory mediators, mediators, IL-10 and TGF. These are, these are suppressive, suppressive cytokines. cytokines. The, key the key differentiation factor is FOXP3. Fox and, and, and these are the these parasitic, are the parasitic infections, infections in which these T regulatory, regulatory cells, cells have been shown, been shown to control host resistance or pathology, um, including um, leishmania models, models, malaria models, and, and these helmets models. Now, as it now turns as it out, turns out um, uh, IL-10 is, is, is a critical, critical mediator, mediator of, of immunoregulation. Immunoregulation. It's so, it's so important, important that, that once, once an effector, an effector cell, cell is turned, is turned on, on to control, to control a, pathogen, a pathogen, that it that has, it to, has be to be turned off. Um, 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 and, and, and as it, as it turns, out, turns out, not only do, do these professional, professional regulators, regulators, these regulatory T cells, make IL-10, but, but 
virtually every effector of CD4 cell, cell and CD8 cell, and CD8 cell. Um, um, eventually, eventually they begin, they begin to, uh, to uh, simultaneously, simultaneously produce, produce in addition. In addition so, so a TH1, a th1 cell, cell that produces, that produces interferon, interferon gamma, gamma. Eventually, eventually it'll, it'll make, make a as a feedback, feedback mechanism, mechanism to dampen, to dampen its, its own response. response. Same with Same TH17 with TH17 cells. cells. I'll, I'll 10 production, ten production by, TH2 by TH2 cells seems, seems to be more stable. stable. It's, it's transient, transient here. here. Okay. okay. IL-10 is, is so, so important, important to dampen, to dampen responses, responses once they once get they turned get on that, on that, um, uh, uh, that myeloid, myeloid cells, cells uh, uh, dendritic, uh, dendritic cells, cells macrophages, macrophages also, also make IL-10. Redundant, redundant pathways, pathways to try, try and dampen, dampen immune, responses immune responses once, once they, get, they turned get turned on. So, so some initial some lessons, lessons here. The here. differential, the differential induction, induction of CD4 T cell, cell subsets, subsets provides, provides an explanation for microbial effect choice. choice. Um, um, and, in and in addition to these professional, professional regulatory, regulatory or suppressor, suppressor T cells, cells effector, effector CD4, CD4 T cells, T cells, cells can, also can also display regulatory, regulatory activity, activity through the constitutive TH2 cells, 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 cells or induced TH1, TH17 cell expression of IL-10. Um, um, and these and were these all were aspects, all aspects of, immune of immune regulation that were learned, that were from, learned from these from parasitic, parasitic disease, disease uh, model. model. Okay, okay, well, let's, well, let's go, go back to this starting, starting point, point of this of dichotomy in the response, response to parasites, parasites. Protozoans, protozoans on the one hand and helminths, helminths on the other hand. The other hand. Um, um, they're, they're activating, activating these, these T helper precursor cells. Um, um, and somehow, and somehow these, these, um, um, these, these, the, the, the activation, activation of these T helper precursor cells during, cells during a, protozoan a protozoan infection, infection like Leishmania, leads, leads to, to uh, the development, development of the uh, uh, TH1, uh, TH1 cells. Whereas worms, worms uh, they, they promote, promote TH, TH uh, precursors uh, to develop, to develop into these into TH2 cells. cells. So, so how, how does, does that happen? That happen? How do, how, do, how, do how do these cells, cells sense, sense these different, these different pathogens, pathogens and go and along go different, along different uh, pathways, uh, pathways of differentiation? Of differentiation. So it so turns it out, turns out these, these, these pathogens, pathogens don't, don't, don't interact, interact with, with these uh, uh, precursor, precursor T cells direct direct directly. That, that the pathogen, pathogen recognition, recognition it's, it's by innate, innate cells, cells provides, provides signals, signals for the CD4, for the CD4 cells, cells uh, uh, effector, effector choice. choice. So, you, so have you have the pathogens here, and, here then and then these are a collection of innate cells. cells. So, these, so are these, are the, the, these are the these immune, immune cells, the lymphocytes, lymphocytes that, will that will be acted, acted upon, upon by these innate, innate cells. cells. But the but sensing of these pathogens initially is not directly by the lymphocytes themselves, but via these innate cells. And the, and the most critical, critical cells, cells that senses, that senses and, and instructs these T helper, helper precursors, precursors how to, how to develop, develop are, are these are dendritic, dendritic cells. cells. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, uh, the, Nobel the Nobel Prize, Prize uh, in, medicine in medicine was awarded to Ralph Steinman. It was it was only five or six years ago. It was actually awarded to him the very day that he died. Was first first. Uh, post uh, posthumous uh, Nobel, Prize Nobel Prize ever awarded. Ever awarded. Um, um, so he so never he received, never received the, news. the news. And but, and they, but they awarded it to him anyhow, anyhow because, because they had made the decision. decision. So he was so the, he first was the first one to discover these, these unusual, unusual cells, cells um, uh, that, that um, uh, in, in, in this in initial this paper, paper in 1978. In 1978 um, um, he found he that he turned them lymphoid dendritic cells. He found them in lymph nodes. And he found and that he they found were that potent, potent stimulators, stimulators of, of a mixed lymphocyte reaction. Mixed lymphocyte reaction, lymph mice. Lymph mixed lymph lymphocyte lymphocyte reaction is mediated, mediated by, T by T cells. And, and the, these, these, these cells that, these that, that look like this, look like this they, had they had these dendrites, these dendrites cells, called dendritic, dendritic, dendritic cells, cells, were incredibly, were incredibly powerful, powerful at mediating and turning those lymphocytes on. So dendritic, so dendritic cells, cells as we all know now, are now the key, are the key professional, professional antigen, antigen presenting cells, presenting cells that, that link innate, innate and adaptive, adaptive immunity. immunity. So in the, so periphery, in the periphery, let's say, let's the, say skin, the skin, we have, we have these, these dendritic, dendritic cells, cells, immature, immature dendritic, dendritic, dendritic cells sitting, in, sitting the skin. in the skin. And now we, and get, now exposure we get exposure to, to an, an antigen. antigen. So, so say a sand fly introduces Leishmania parasites into the skin. Um, um, one of the one early, of the early cells, cells that will uh, will, uh, will sense and perhaps take up these parasites, parasites are these immature, immature dendritic, dendritic cells, cells in the skin. skin. 
and, and the pathogen, the pathogen um, so, they um, so they have certain, have certain kinds, kinds of receptors, receptors for these pathogens, for these pathogens. And, and there's, there's a, signaling a signaling response, signaling response, response as, a as a result of this, of this pathogen, pathogen recognition. recognition. And as, and a, result as a result of this, of this signaling, signaling, these, these immature, immature dendritic, dendritic cells, cells will now, now begin, begin to, mature to mature and migrate, and migrate from, from the peripheral, peripheral tissue, tissue uh, into, uh, into the draining, the draining lymph, lymph nodes. nodes. And the maturation, and the maturation um, involves, um, involves ex uh, uh, an upregulated up expression, expression of MAT, of MAT class 1 and class 2 co-stimulatory co molecules, molecules um, um, and, and secretion, secretion of, of various, various cytokines, cytokines, and we'll and talk we'll more talk about more that. About and then, and then these, these, these mature DCs, they, they, they go to the draining lymph nodes, nodes where they can they interact, interact with, with uh, naive, naive T lymphocytes, lymphocytes and, and, and initiate, initiate um, the, um, activation, the activation, the priming, priming of, of these naive, naive T lymphocytes, T lymphocytes in, 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 in the draining, draining lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. Um, um, so, so that's, that's how, how a primary, a primary immune, immune response is initiated. initiated. And, and, um, um, and, and this is the key role of these innate cells. Um, in, um, in, in that in pathway. That pathway. Um, um, so, so, a huge, a huge amount, of amount of effort over the over past, past 20 or 20 so or years, so years now since, now since, since the discovery, the discovery of these, of these uh, uh, innate, innate cells, cells, these dendritic, dendritic cells, 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 as key, as key uh, components, components uh, of, uh, of an immune, immune response, response as key, key link between, between innate, innate cells and, and, and adaptive, adaptive cells in the immune system. What are the nature of these pathogen recognition signals? Um, um, so, the so the dendritic, dendritic cell, cell acts as a dual, dual antigen-presenting antigen cell, cell and regulator of parasite-triggered parasite TH1, TH2, TH2 effector, effector choice. choice. So, so let's go back, back to this notion, notion of, of um, effector, effector choice. choice. So, so, the, the, uh, so, now, so we now we know that antigen, antigen, these antigen-presenting cells, these professional antigen-presenting cells, they present antigen to these T cells. But, but they, they also, also produce, produce instructive, instructive cytokines, cytokines that, that determine the nature, the nature of, of the, response the response that, that those, those precursor, precursor T lymphocytes, T lymphocytes will, undergo. will undergo. Because, because the T cells, um, um, they, 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 don't they don't receive, receive just, just one signal, the antigen signal. signal. They have, they to, they have receive to receive multiple, multiple signals, signals, including, including these, these signals from instructive, from instructive cytokines, cytokines that tell them what effector class they should differentiate into. So we so now we know now that, that uh, uh, IL-12 IL is the is key cytokine produced, produced by these by innate, innate cells, cells to, to in, uh, uh, that uh, lead that to the differentiation, differentiation of, of TH1, TH1 cells. cells. So, so, so it is the, is the critical, critical instructive cytokine, cytokine for TH1, TH1 differentiation. IL-4 IL is the is key cytokine, cytokine for TH2, for TH2 differentiation. But it is still unclear what the source of IL-4 is from. And it does, and it not, does seem not seem to be, to be from, from these, uh, uh, the, these these dendritic, dendritic cells. cells. Um, that um, there that there must, be must be other sources, sources of IL-4 that, that contribute, contribute to THT development. Um, and, and it is and still, it is still unclear, unclear the nature of the of signals. The signals. That, that, uh, uh, so one so hypothesis, hypothesis is, is the absence, the absence of, of IL-12. It's simply a default pathway. In the absence, in the absence of, of this powerful, this powerful TH1, TH1 instructive cytokine, you default to a TH2, TH2 response. response. Um, uh, but IL-4 is, is also required, also required so, so it's not it's clear, not clear uh, uh, just uh, mechanistically just what, that what that pathway, pathway is. Pathway is. Um, um, but, but in terms of terms TH1 of development, IL-12 is, is absolutely critical. critical. And, and it was, it was again, again, a parasitic infection model that produced the most compelling information about the instructive role of IL-12 in TH1 development. We're going back to the toxoplasma Gondii Gondi infection model in a mouse. Um, um, and and what, 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 what the work the work that was done here was, done here just, was taking just taking antigen, antigen from, from this this uh, uh, this, uh, this parasite, parasite and, 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 and sticking it into a mouse, a mouse um, um, I guess intravenously, um, 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 and then a few, a few hours, hours post injection, post -injection um, um, they looked they in looked the spleen of these mice. mice. And they, and found they found this, this um, um, huge, huge accumulation, accumulation of dendritic cells, cells that stain for IL-12. Um, um, so, so these so were these dendritic, were dendritic cells, cells that uh, uh, had come, come from, from the periphery. The periphery and, and, uh, and, 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 and once they once got to they lymphoid, got lymphoid tissue, tissue, they began, they began to secrete IL-12 um, um, and um, initiate a T cell response. Okay. Okay. 
So, 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 so from here on out, the work I'm going to describe um, um, ha has, to, has do to do with how, with how these innate, innate cells, cells sense different, different pathogens. pathogens. What, are what, what are the pattern, pattern recognition receptors, receptors they use? They what are the what signaling the pathways, pathways they use? They use um, um, for innate, innate cells, cells to signal these various activation pathways for Th1 or Th2 responses. But, but, but this, this has, has been, been intensive, intensive work, work over the last, over the last uh, I suppose, 10 or 15 years, years and, and not necessarily, not necessarily uh, work, uh, work that was that done was in parasitic infection, infection models. models. Um, um, although although pa parasites, parasites contributed, contributed to our understanding. Our understanding. Um, um, so, 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 again, so again, sensing, sensing of, of microbial, microbial signatures by host, by host pattern, pattern recognition receptors is a complicated slide. It's meant to be complicated. To convey, to convey to you that, that, that a, huge a huge effort, effort in immunolo immunology, immunology research, research over, the over the past 10 or 15, 15 years has been, has been devoted, devoted to understanding, to understanding the, nature the nature of these of innate, innate responses, responses in, in, in these antigen-presenting antigen cells, cells, these innate cells, innate cells um, um, that, that um, uh, present, present antigen, antigen to T cells, cells and, 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 and uh, 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 produce, produce cytokines, cytokines that, that determine that effector choice. So, so um, um, we're, we're, we're going to talk, talk a lot a about toll-like toll receptors. Like receptors uh, 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 um, 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 le let me just let me broadly define, define some of these, um, some of these, um, um, these host, host pattern, pattern, pattern recognition, recognition receptors. receptors. There, there are, are sensors, sensors for microbial, for microbial cell, cell walls, walls uh, 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 in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, on uh, the uh, membranes, membranes of these innate, innate cells. cells. There, there are sensors of nucleic acids in endocytic compartments. There are cytosolic receptors that are not uh, membrane associated um, that, that sense various microbial components. Um, and the recognition that systems they use are toll-like receptors, nod-like receptors, C-type lectins, helicases, and I don't know why this is so fuzzy. The, the, the most important discoveries um, in terms of innate sensing were these toll-like receptor signaling. So toll receptors were initially discovered in Drosophila fruit flies, and these were important receptors in dorsoventro ventral embryonic pattern, uh, patterning. So it had nothing to do with innate immunity in these flies uh, until later. Uh, toll mutants refer to the fact that these mutants could not establish proper dorsal ventral axis. Toll in German means great. Apparently, this was one of the words describing uh, the scientist's enthusiasm after observing mutant flies. So that's where toll receptor comes from. So uh, Jules Hoffman and his colleagues in fruit flies showed that in addition to pattern uh, uh, dorsal uh, ventral pattern patterning, uh, to uh, toll mutant flies were susceptible to fungal infections. And then after, shortly after that, the mammalian homologs were discovered and designated as toll-like receptors. Um, and toll-like receptors recognize specific patterns and pathogens which are not observed in mammals. So this was the key discovery. Again, this was a Nobel Prize winning discovery by Jules Hoffman. Um, it was the same year that uh, uh, um, uh, the discovery of dendritic the dendritic cell Nobel Prize w w w was given. Um, so toll, uh, fruit flies that were mute, uh, null mutants for toll, uh, they died very quickly of these fungal infections. Um, so so th this is just a summary of the pattern recognition receptors involved in innate signaling. Um, there are plasma and endosomal membrane-associated receptors, and I've just mentioned these toll-like receptors, which recognize viral, bacterial, fungal, protozoan, helminth, uh, microbe-associated molecular patterns. They're called uh, MAMPs. Um, and they trigger NF-kappa-B-dependent pro-inflammatory cytokine responses. Uh, and they're encoded by germline genes, unlike antigen receptors on B and T cells. And then there are these cytosolic receptors. These are more recent discovery. These are these nod-like receptors. And nod receptors recognize bacterial peptidic glycans, muropeptide, 
and they trigger uh, NF kappa B dependent cytokine production. Um, and now proteins they recognize RNA and ATP and crystals and and they trigger caspase one recruitment dial one and LA eighteen. We're we're, we're going to just spend a bit more time on these toll-like receptors because they're absolutely key to in responses and how immune responses are initiated in in mammals. Um, and I, again, this has been one of the, these are the major discoveries in the past decade or so in immunology. Um, so these are the mammalian TLRs, um, and the ones in green, um, these are TLRs with bacterial ligands. Uh, the ones in blue here are with viral ligands. So you can see these, these surface membrane-associated TLRs that mainly recognize bacterial ligands like LPS or flagellin. Uh, uh, diacyl uh, uh, lipopeptides, triacyl lipopeptides. The, these endosomal TLRs, they mainly recognize nucleic acids, either double-stranded RNA, DNA, and single-stranded RNA, um, and they're critical for viral recognitions, and they're endosomal. But in each case, they lead to, um, they're associated with signaling pathways that lead to um, the um, translocation of these transcription factors, which activate um, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine responses. So this is the general structure of TLRs. TLRs, they can recognize more than one type of ligand through extracellular, these leucine-rich domains. Um, and they interact with signaling components through these toll IL-1 receptor domains, which are called tier domains. And this is critical for um, intracellular uh, signaling. And uh, most of these toll-like receptors have an adapter molecule that um, links these tier domains with these um, uh, uh, intracellular signaling um, molecules. Uh, so mid-88 is a critical adapter molecule involved in signaling of m m uh, most of the um, surface membrane associate associated t TLRs. And again, it leads to the activation of this transcription factor, NF kappa B, trans translocates to the nu nucleus, and you get upregulation of IL 12, TNF alpha, and IL 1 beta. Um, this is pro IL 1 beta, and we'll come back to this. These, these uh, endosomal TLRs um, are mainly for viral recognition of viral nucleic acids and leads to the upper, uh, th this transcription factor. IRF3, which translocates and leads to the um, um, uh, uh, induction of, of type 1 interferon, which are critical for uh, antiviral immunity. Okay? So this is how these innate cells, this is absolutely critical for how innate cells sense um, these pathogens. Um, so going back to a parasitic infection model, toxoplasma, um, this was one of the first studies in, uh, in any infection model, M uh, mid-88 uh, 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 knockout mouse. So it l it's lacking this adapter protein, so can't signal. Um, uh, these TLRs can no longer signal. And these mice die very quickly. Okay. So a huge amount of work has been done in parasitic infections. These are... Uh, M mid-88 and TLR deficiencies in host responses to protozoa, leishmania, African trips, trips and malaria, toxoplasma. When you knock out um, these toll-like receptors, even for these eukaryotic pathogens, um, their, uh, their host resistance is impaired. So when we discuss specifically leishmania, the question is, um, what are the TLRs that are active, recon used by um, uh, 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 leishmania to, to activate an immune response? And what are the ligands from leishmania that activate those TLRs? So huge amount of work over the past uh, decade or more identifying the TLR ligands found in protozoan parasites, um, including leishmania and, and uh, malaria. Um, and um, and so we'll discuss again in the context of leishmania the sort of ligands that are um, 
that are associated uh, and, and, and used um, by these innate cells to sense and be activated uh, during these infections. So I told you that the activation of these TLRs leads to the upregulation of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-12 and TNF and IL-1. So IL-1 is an absolutely critical and central mediator of inflammation. Um, it's called IL-1 because it was the first interleukin discovered and described. Interleukin means it's produced by one leukocyte and acts on another leukocyte. Now there are of interleukins now is in the, uh, I have no idea, I think it's in the hundreds, but, but this was the first, okay? So it was a soluble protein secreted by monocytes, macrophages, or accessory cells involved in activation, both T and B cells, and, and potentiated their response to antigens or mitogens. It's released early in an immune system response um, by th these innate cells. It stimulates T cell proliferation. Um, another effect of IL-1 is it causes fever. So the principal function of IL-1 is as a mediator of the host inflammatory response to infection. So again, interleukin-1 is a central mediator of inflammation. It acts on all of these different cell types. Um, epithelial cells, hepatocytes, fibroblasts, and these innate cells, monocytes, macrophages, DCs, and all these lymphoid um, cells, T, uh, uh, T, T cells, T, T regulatory cells, uh, mast cells, eosinophils, neutrophils. So they all have receptors for IL-1. That, that's how criti critically important uh, um, uh, interleukin-1 is for, for uh, in inflammation and immunity. It is so important that it is very tightly regulated. There are multiple signals to generate an active form of IL-1. So the first signal we've already described, these pattern-associated molecular patterns act, are, um, act via these TLR signaling events to upregulate pro-IL-1 beta. But this is not the active form of IL-1. It doesn't do anything. It needs, for the active form, the mature form of IL-1 to be produced, there needs to be a second signal. And it's, uh, it's, it's, these are some of the more recent and, and um, seminal findings in immunology, is the nature of these, they're called inflammasomes, that process IL-1 to its active mature and secreted form. It also acts on IL-18, another important inflammatory mediator. So both pro-IL-1 and uh, pro-IL-18. Um, so we're going to talk just a bit about inflammasomes. It's a huge, um, it's a huge focus of research in, in innate immunity these days. Um, both the nature of the signals that um, activate the inflammasome and um, the, uh, uh, the consequences of inflammasome activation. Um, so the inflammasome is a, a macromolecular cytosolic um, uh, complex um, that is generated uh, when an agonist, and we'll, it, it is still somewhat unclear what the nature of the agonist is. Is it um, the infection itself? Is it um, s some change in the cell, in the physiology of the cell that uh, that um, that allows these this sensing these nod-like receptors. In this case, this N NLRP3. That's again, these are cytosolic receptors. So these agonists ha have to gain access to the cytosol. Keep that in mind when we talk about Leishmania, which is a phagosomal pathogen. Nonetheless it is clear that the inflammasome becomes activated in Leishmania infection. So various agonists will activate these sensing molecules. Um, this NLRP3 has this pyrin domain, which then associates with this ASC molecule, which, uh, which, which also has a pyrin domain and, and self-associates, but it also has a CAR domain. 
And then that card domain then associates with the card domain on Procaspase 1. And that then assembles this macromolecular cytosol, a complex called the inflammasome. And the whole point of this is simply to generate the active form of this enzyme, caspase 1. And it is caspase 1 that can then cleave pro-IL-1 beta and pro-IL-18 to their active form, which can now be secreted from the cell. Okay. So IL-1 is such a critical and powerful um, inflammatory mediator that it is very carefully regulated. So the nature of the uh, innate responses that lead to um, uh, 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 the secretion of the active form of IL-1 has been such a huge part of um, immunology research over the past decade. Um, so uh, it, the sensors of danger signals they clearly do sense the pathogen's cells, but again, these are cytosolic sensors. Um, and it's thought that, that as a consequence of, it, of infection in cells, there can be efflux of potassi potassium. That's sufficient to activate um, uh, uh, these inflammasomes. Other danger signals are large particles um, and, and UV and skin irritants, um, ATP. Um, so, so it is still a really a very active field of research, the nature of these signals that activate the inflammasome. So I'm going to finish up uh, this, this first lecture by just uh, m making, um, uh, emphasizing um, uh, uh, a very important aspect of these parasites, that they're highly sophisticated eukaryotic infection agents. And they've co-evolved with the immune system They've learned to evade host effector mechanisms and regulate immunopathology to pr produce long-lasting infections. So the hallmark of parasitic infections is chronicity. Um, so by definition, if they're chronic, if they persist in a, in, in a host, they must have um, some strategy for immune evasion. And so immune evasion is a hallmark of all of these especially vector-borne parasitic diseases like malaria and leishmaniasis. And immune evasion producing prolonged infection or chronicity, is, has, there's been a powerful selective pressure to, to evade immunity, to potentiate their transmissibility from one host to another. Because unlike aerosol or waterborne pathogens, getting from one host to another via the bite of an insect is not sufficient. So if they produce only acute infection that lasted only a few days, the chances of their being picked up by an insect and transmitted to another is quite low. So a powerful evolutionary pressure to persist, to produce these chronic infections. That is the hallmark of these parasitic infections. So a lot of what we study is the nature, is the games parasite plays to evade immunity. Um, so, and we're going to discuss this a lot in the context of leishmania. Just some general points in terms of uh, 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 various microbial pathogens. The ones in red are uh, parasitic um, eukaryotic pathogens. Evasion of innate immunity. How do they survive within phagocytic cells? They can inhibit the fusion of a phagosome and a lysosome. So toxoplasma does that, as we'll see leishmania can do that. They'll escape from the phagosome get into the cytosol, where, the f wh where the, 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 these powerful host defenses of cell neutrophil and a macrophage can no longer work because they've evaded all these hydrolytic enzymes from lysosomes by escaping in into the cytosol. So Trypanosoma cruzi does this. Re resistance to lysosomal enzymes. Leishmania actually doesn't even mind living in a phagolysosome. It, it, is, it seems resistant to digestion by these powerful hydrolytic enzymes in, in, in that compartment. Evasion of acquired immunity. This is perhaps the most familiar to you, antigenic variation. African trypanosomes, they produce chronicity because they produce cyclic waves of parasitemia. The, the host makes an immune response to uh, the surface proteins on 
on the trypanosome, and then it changes its surface coat and puts new ones on. So the host has to start again and make new ones, and they and that's how they produce. So malaria also varies its surface antigen, and giardia, sequestration. Malaria is is clever. The blood stages of malaria are so clever they live in a r red blood cell which is very difficult for the immune system to recognize because it doesn't have class one or class two molecules on it. Um, so they sequester themselves. Trypanosoma cruzi, the agent of Chagas disease, hides in muscles, also difficult for the immune system to recognize. And then immune deviation. We've seen this in, s in the mouse model of leishmaniasis. Instead of a Th1 response, um, these mice made a Th2 response. But immunosuppression, we're going to talk about a lot in the context of leash mania, activation of regulatory T cells and suppressive dendritic cells or macrophages. So we're going to end with where we started about vaccines, anti-parasite vaccines, so we don't have any. And I'm going to pose this, this question or this point uh, uh, that that perhaps explains why we don't yet have any uh, vaccines against these, these parasites. For a given antiparasite vaccine to succeed, it will have to outperform the immune response to natural primary infection. So the immune response to natural infection is not so good. It doesn't lead to sterile immunity. We've, uh, we've just been talking about all of these parasites produce chronic infection. They somehow evade immunity. So a vaccine is going to have to do better than the natural immune response. And this is fundamentally different from how virtually all licensed vaccines work, uh, which are designed to mimic the sterilizing response to natural infection without producing disease. So a rubella vaccine, or a polio vaccine, or a pneumococcal vaccine, those infections are acute. If we survive those infections, we're immune to reinfection. So we're, we just, uh, the vaccine is just doing the exact same thing as our immune response to the natural exposure, but without producing disease. But in the case of these, these parasitic infections that don't produce a strong naturally acquired immune response, now we're asking a uh, an artificial vaccine to do better than that. And so far, we haven't been able to, to do that. I'll just end on a slightly uplifting note, ever so slightly. We're going back to the early days when, they f when the News and Swise first developed the first uh, recombinant vaccine against malaria. Well, as it turns out, um, in the past decade, based on their groundbreaking studies in the mouse, um, there have been clinical trials of, uh, a com uh, of a subunit malaria vaccine called RTSS. And it does comprise uh, components of the circumsporozoite protein. Um, and hepatitis B is surface antigen. It's, it's a very sophisticated uh, 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 va vaccine to enhance the immunogenicity. But it is fundamentally based on the early uh, work that the Nusenswags did in, in the mouse. And huge amount of work um, in phase three clinical trials. Um, so th this was a uh, report in the New England Journal of Medicine, a four-year efficacy of this RTSS vaccine and its interaction with malaria exposure. So a phase three clinical trial of this vaccine involving 15,000 children across seven African countries showed a vaccine efficacy for malaria of 50% in older children, but only 30% in infants, which were really the target population, and without significant protection from severe malaria at, at 18 months. So already by 18 months, the protection had waned and disappeared. And if you consider um, the entire cohort, this, it's just this level, the control vaccine was a rabies vaccine given to these children and this is the protection uh, that was seen. This is the best that any anti-parasite vaccine has done. And, and um, there was some excitement that this anti-malaria vaccine achieved this level of protection. Now the question going forward is, 
um, you know, you'll still save some children by this level of protection. Um, is it worth applying this vaccine, uh, you know, as a program of, of malaria, uh, as one of the tools in malaria uh, con con control, uh, given, given how modest effective this vaccine was okay so I think we'll stop there um, and the discussion um, the next discussion will be a much briefer talk okay so so how long is our break oh yeah happy to take questions So I'm not sure what you're asking. The, this 50 percent? Yeah, no. So that I, I, I think this was not considered significant. So I, I, I think the, the, on, the only efficacy they had any confidence in was this 50 percent in older children. It ri yeah. Um, so how long a break? T ten, ten minute break? <laughs>
Okay, now we'll begin our discussion of leishmaniasis. Um, so this slide emphasizes a m most important aspect of leishmanial diseases, and that is there is not one form of leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is really a spectrum of diseases. And that produces many different disease forms, clinical forms. And these clinical forms are associated with many different species or strains of leishmania. Um, so the most common clinical form are cutaneous lesions, cutaneous leishmaniasis. And these are the different species of leishmania. So, so again, there are at least 20 different species of leishmania um, that infect humans. So these are the main ones that I've listed here. And again, the most prevalent clinical form of the disease produced by these species are these localized cutaneous lesions. Um, now, cutaneous leishmaniasis can be zoonotic, which means um, non-humans are the principal reservoir hosts, and anthropogenic, which means the transmission is primarily between um, human hosts. And then there is a mucosal form, which is a terribly destructive, very chronic infection uh, produced by this species, Leishmania brasiliensis. It's an infection of the mucosal tissue and leads to erosion over e months and years of uh, the, 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 <coughs> the mucosa, um, and very difficult to, to treat. This is a disease common in South American countries. There are diffuse cutaneous forms in which uh, these, uh, the lesions are not localized. They begin to spread and are not contained. Um, this is a somewhat rare occurrence. And then the most severe uh, and epidemic forms are visceral forms of leishmaniasis, um, which can be zoonotic, again, in which humans are not the principal reservoirs. Um, uh, in this case, dogs are the principal reservoirs. And anthropogenic visceral leishmaniasis, in which humans are, are the principal reservoirs of infection. And then there is a disease called post lazar dermal leishmaniasis, which occurs in an individual that has been treated uh, for visceral disease and some weeks or months after treatment, they develop these dermal lesions, okay? So I've already mentioned that some of these, uh, these leishmanial diseases are zoonotic um, and there are different reservoir hosts, like different uh, rodents and dogs and sloths, cats, cows, hyrax. All of these different species of leishmania, and regardless of the disease forms they produce and regardless of the nature of their reservoir hosts, they are all transmitted by the bites of phlebotomines and flies. And there are even more species of phlebotomine sandflies that transmit leishmania than there are species of leishmania. So I just want you to appreciate the, the, the complexity of, <coughs> of the host, parasite, and vector uh, uh, relationships. The, these are just some of the proven sandfly vector species. Um, So the geographic distribution of the leishmaniasis will depend in large measure by the distribution of their competent vectors. But in the New World, in South America primarily, it, 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 these, these neotropical sandflies, they have an enormous species and strain complex variability. Um, so I haven't listed them here. Um, they have a different genus name. They're called Lutzemia. They're still sandflies. In the old world, the genus is Phlebotomus. 
Uh, and again, these are the principal uh, sandfly species that are transmitting various uh, uh, species of leishmania. So in green, we'll see distribution of the visceral forms of disease, and we'll, we'll look at this uh, in, in more detail later. And in orange um, are the cutaneous forms of, of disease. Okay, so the geographic distribution is in tropical and subtropical regions. Uh, and again, found where sand flies are, um, <coughs> are found. The Leishmania life cycle is shown here. Um, let's start uh, uh, l looking at the life cycle in the sand fly vector. So Leishmania are um, protozoan uh, uh, parasites, kinetoplastid protozoan parasites, that in the sand fly are found as extracellular promastigote forms. These are flagellated forms, um, and they're extracellular, and they're confined to the midgut of the sand fly. So unlike malaria parasites, which develop in the mosquito midgut, um, malaria parasites inv they invade the wall of the mosquito and get into the hemocele and eventually into the salivary glands of the mosquito. Leishmania are confined to the alimentary tract, to the digestive tract. I'm, I'm always interested that even people who've worked on leishmaniasis for decades, they assume that leishmania are transmitted in the saliva of phlebotomine sand flies. No, so leishmania, are n they do not get to the salivary glands. They are confined to the digestive tract, uh, to the lumen of the intestine. And again, as these extracellular flagellated forms. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a, a lecture on vector biology. So we're going we're to uh, look in detail at uh, the, the uh, uh, interactions of these, these parasites with, with the sand fly vector. Um, these, these flies will transmit low numbers of of uh, these flagellated forms into the skin of a mammalian host, including man. And eventually, these parasites end up in the, the phagosomes of, of macrophages, primarily, um, where they transform into these ovoid forms that still have a tiny flagellum, but they're essentially not motile anymore. Um, so they are these amastigote forms, and, and they're found in the phagolysosomal compartments of their host macrophages, um, where they replicate and then will invade other macrophages and produce the, the clinical forms of, of disease. And, uh, and then a sandfly can pick up uh, in macrophages from blood or from tissue in the skin, and the cycle starts over again. Uh, a lot of our discussion as we look at innate responses and adaptive immunity will we'll focus on these really early events in the skin at the site of parasite delivery by a sandfly bite. And, and we'll be um, uh, looking more detail at the nature of the cells that are, uh, are, are infected early on at, uh, at, <coughs> at uh, these infection sites in the skin. Uh, uh, but, but just keep in mind that these are intracellular pathogens, intrafagosomal pathogens. So by their very nature, the kind of immunity that will be required to, uh, to control these infections, they won't be antibodies because antibodies won't have access to these intracellular parasites. They will be, uh, the immunity will require cell-mediated immunity, primarily CD4 cells that will elaborate cytokines to activate these infected macrophages to kill. So we'll discuss that nature of immunity um, in, uh, I think, on Wednesday. Um, so th this is just an updated classification. Th these are the Leishmania species and subspecies that infect humans, that are important in humans. There are other Leishmania species. These are... 
uh, 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 organisms that infect uh, these sour leishmania that infect uh, reptiles, I believe. But th these are the critical ones that infect people. That, uh, the, the ones in blue are the ones found in the New World, and the ones in red, these are the species that are found um, in, in, in South America primarily. Uh, this is just to, you don't need to look in detail at this, this is just to make the point that um, we benefit enormously now from the fact that most of the major leishmania species have, um, their, their, their genomes have been sequenced um, and published the, the, in blue sh shows the publications and then the, these other ones are, are databases that have been assembled uh, for all these different species. So this has been an, uh, an enormous resource for, um, for uh, lots of research on, on, on leishmania, um, both to identify targets for vaccine development, for drug development, um, and for uh, the various cell biological studies. Um, I'll, I'll just spend a bit of time on, on this slide. It shows the clinical and epidemiologic characteristics of the main Leishmania species in the old world. So again, these are the main species, Leishmania donovani. This is important because this is the parasite producing the main form of disease seen in India, which is visceral VL and PKDL. Um, and we're going to talk in much more detail about visceral leishmaniasis um, at, at the end of this lecture. Um, th this, this is just to indicate that, well, first of all, VL is fatal. Um, and in terms of risk groups um, in the Indian subcontinent, it's predominantly adolescents and young adults, for example, much younger children in Sudan, no clearly established risk factors for the development of post Khalazar during leishmaniasis. And it's anthroponotic, it, and so humans are, as far as we know, the only reservoirs of infection on the Indian subcontinent and, and, um, and even in, 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 in Africa. Um, Leishmania tropica, these are uh, cutaneous uh, uh, parasites that are seen primarily in, in the Middle East countries. Um, again, no well-defined risk groups um, these, these are cutaneous lesions that self-heal, but it can take up to one year for these lesions to heal. Um, uh, leish, leishmania major, again, cu uh, the main agent of cutaneous leishmaniasis in the old world. Um, these are self-healing, um, but can take many months for healing. Again, importantly, no def well-defined risk groups. Um, the <coughs> the uh, infection reservoirs are rodents. Um, and then Leishmania and phantom is the other agent of visceral leishmaniasis. In this case, it's zoonotic, and dogs are the principal reservoirs. Um, and and the, there, there are risk factors here that are well identified. It's mainly young children, which is why the parasite is called infantum. It's more of an opportunity, despite the fact that it produces a clinical disease similar to Leishmania donovani, which you have here in India. Leishmania in phantom, uh, this species um, infects pr primarily immunocompromised um, individuals or young children. Um, and, and dogs are the principal reservoirs. Okay. Uh, in the New World, um, there are various cutaneous strains. It's mainly cutaneous disease. The, the visceral strain, Leishmania in phantom, this this is identical to the Leishmania and phantom in the old world that I just talked about. It was brought to the new world by the, by the Spaniards and the Portuguese. So it's identical to the Leishmania and phantom in the Mediterranean region. Okay. And it was brought, uh, whereas these other cutaneous strains are genetically rather more distant from the old world Leishmanias and produce primarily cutaneous disease I, I want to emphasize again, in terms of the epidemiology, no well-defined risk factors as to why some people get disease and, and others don't. Um, and for these new world cutaneous strains, they're all zoonoses, various rodents, marsupials, possums, dogs, sloths, okay? Very difficult to control 
when it's zoonotic transmission. Um, so uh, j we'll, we'll just go through some of the epidemiologic characters of the old world species. So Leishmania major is the main agent of cutaneous leishmaniasis in the old world, this is distribution. The lesions are usually pretty benign, can, can be a single localized lesion. Again, it will heal on its own, but it, it's, it's still a chronic infection. It takes weeks or months for it to heal. So e even though it is self-limiting, um, these things will heal. These are the principal sandfly vectors. And the rodents are, uh, uh, and, and the reservoirs of infection are various desert rodents. So the reason Leishmania major is the favored Leishmania species to work with in the laboratory is because its normal infection reservoir is in fact a rodent. So the laboratory mouse is a beautiful um, infection uh, model uh, in the laboratory. Okay. Um, now these infections, can. here's an Afghan boy with multiple severe lesions on the face. And, and this is seen quite frequently. So this is anthroponotic cutaneous leishmania, another species, Leishmania tropica. These lesions tend to be smaller and drier, but much more chronic. And this is its distribution different. You'll, you'll note that each of these Leishmania species are transmitted by a different species of, uh, uh, of sandfly vector. And we'll talk about th that, those species restrictions this coevolution between parasite species and sandfly species tomorrow, but it's it's very interesting. Uh, uh, a nat one natural vector that transmits a certain species of Leishmania won't transmit another species of Leishmania. These these beautiful coevolutionary co uh, uh, um, relationships. Um, interesting thing about Tropica lesions after treatment, um, they can reactivate. So here's, here's a reactivated lesion around the initial, uh, uh, initial lesion that would have healed. Uh, this just makes the point that these cutaneous lesions, um, particularly in these urban environments, um, these cutaneous infections have become epidemic in the Middle East as a consequence of, of conflict. So in Syria, particularly um, in various cities in Syria, when, when people have gotten in there to, um, to determine the, the intensity of transmission, the number of cases, it has been really unbelievable the number of cases. They, it, it, just the, 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 the intensity of infection that's going on because there's no treatment available um, and, no, and no way to control the, this transmission cycle. Okay. Um, so then, in terms of zoonotic visceral leishmaniasis caused by Leishmanian phantom, again, in the Mediterranean ba basin, this is primarily a, a veterinary problem. So it is very common for dogs to get canine leishmaniasis, and they're the principal reservoirs of transmission of Leishmanian phantom to humans. Um, and, and, and again, uh, Leishmanian phantom, when it infects humans, these are usually young children or immune compromised adults. Okay, and then Leishmania um, donovani is anthroponotic. Um, again, visceral Leishmaniasis, the distribution is primarily in, in countries in East Africa and then in, <coughs> in the Indian subcontinent, including so Northeast India, primarily Bihar and into Nepal and Bang Bangladesh. And then at, um, after treatment, a certain percentage of individuals, for reasons that are not well, uh, well explained at all, will develop these dermal lesions called post colazar dermal leishmaniasis. So in India, it, it's, it, it de de depends on who's counting and which, re which, which place, but it's 10 to 15% of individuals will develop PKDL. Um, so, so again, these clinical manifestations have very discrete uh, parasite species associations. 
These are the species associated with visceral disease. These are the species associated with cutaneous. Um, and Leishmania brasiliensis produces these mucosal, these very chronic destructive mucosal lesions in, in South America. Um, if, if we look at the sandfly vectors present in the Indian subcontinent and the nature of the disease, Leishmanial disease is seen, it's interesting. The, the, the competent vectors for cutaneous Leishmaniasis, Papatazi and Sargenti, are distributed in many different places in Pakistan and India. Um, and yet, cutaneous disease is only, there is cutaneous Leishmaniasis in Rajasthan, um, where, where in, in Gujarat, okay, and, and there's a lot of cutaneous disease in Pakistan. Uh, but it's interesting that parasite has not, these cutaneous parasites haven't found its way, despite the fact that there are competent vectors um, in the southern part of India. Um, so phlebotomous that's is that is the vector of Leishmania donovanae, which is the agent of visceral Leishmaniasis. Um, it's found in many different parts of India, and yet uh, visceral disease is confined, again, to this, these endemic zones in the northeast, um, in, in principally Bihar, but into Bangladesh and Nepal. Um, there is some visceral disease down here. Um, what I want to draw your attention to is a recent finding in Sri Lanka that this is cutaneous is not due to these um, cutaneous strains, but not, not due to Leishmania major or tropica, but to Leishmania donomani, which had only ever been associated with visceral Leishmaniasis. But in Sri Lanka, they see a lot of cutaneous disease um, um, and, and the transmission here is by Phlebotomus argentipes. So th this is just to, to make the point that there's been a fascinating change um, in, in, in evolution of this parasite strain. This is some genomic comparisons of isolates from, um, from India, Nepal, Bangladesh, as compared to Sri Lanka. So there are some genomic differences. But again, these are all parasites. This is a cutaneous lesion from a patient um, with these L. Donomani um, infections in the skin. Um, th this patient doesn't have any sign of visceral infection, so it doesn't have a persistent fever. The infection seems confined to this localized cutaneous site. And if you put visceral strains of Donomani in a mouse, they produce they don't produce cutaneous pathology. But this strain from Sri Lanka, if you put it in a hamster or a mouse, they produce these lesions. If you put it in the skin, the visceral strain, if you put it in the skin, will disseminate in a mouse to, to the spleen and produce pathology in the spleen. But this cutaneous strain from S Sri Lanka, if you put it in the skin, produces cutaneous pathology, but no visceral pathology. So, so there's been this fascinating alteration in the genotype and phenotype of the Leishmania donomani parasites on the, the Indian sub, subcontinent. Um, okay, so just some words about diagnosis. So uh, the classical diagnosis for uh, all Leishmanial diseases is through microscopic observation of amastigotes. These are the tissue amastigotes, these ovoid um, a master good forms, which this, this, this is the nucleus, this is the kinetoplast, or mitochondrial d DNA, um, which is, which is uh, characteristic of these kinetoplastid organisms. So these are, um, these are s s uh, stained biopsy pre preps from either the spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes, or skin following Gimps's staining. You'll see these intracellular uh, a mastigots on these tissue preps. The other way to, for like, uh, for a diagnosis is is to take biopsied material, um, whether it's blood or for, from tissue from skin scrapings or from spleen um, or bone marrow, and just put it into culture medium and grow out the insect stage of the parasite. 
Remember, the insect stage is an extracellular flagellated promastigut stage, um, which grows pretty well in, in azenic culture. It just needs a lot of serum, and they'll, they'll grow pretty well in azenic culture medium. Um, and, and, but uh, um, so, so that's another way to, if you can't see on, on these tissue preps, these stained tissue preps, um, you, you can just put it in the culture. You have to wait a few days, and, and hopefully these promastigots will start to grow out. Um, but the, the di diagnostics have really been um, transformed by these molecular approaches using uh, PCR, which enables the amplification of DNA usually, but also RNA through repetitive cycles in vitro. Description of several species Specific DNA fragments has made this method suitable, uh, and really the, the method of choice for leash, leash mania diagnosis since the 1990s. And I, I won't go over this. There's been such a lot of activity um, defining the, the different uh, DNA based and, and in comparison to non DNA based methods. Um, the, the, the advantage of, of, of the, these PCR methods is you can detect directly in clinical samples. You don't have to grow them out. And depending upon the primers that you use, you can amplify up, uh, you, you can amplify up um, markers that tell you not just the genus, not just that it's Leishmania, but the species and even the subspecies of Leishmania. Um, so huge advantages to these, these molecular diagnostic approaches. Um, this just summarizes the huge uh, work done to characterize the different primer pairs that are targeting either, you can barely see this, protein coding genes or these kinetoplastid DNA, um, maxi circle or mini circle genes, uh, or ribosomal DNAs um, to, for, for, uh, for PCR diagnosis uh, for all, all the different species of Leishmania. So a huge amount of work to, to optimize these uh, these these uh, these PCR approaches and the targets that are are are, are amplified for diagnosis. Um, I, th well, I think we'll skip that. So th th then we'll we'll finish with a discussion of drugs. So um, so so ri the the most I, I have to say that um, th there's been a lot of research over the past. Uh, 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 D decades in leishmaniasis, I, 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 I've emphasized that that research has failed to yield uh, a, 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 an effective vaccine. The research that has been in fantastically successful is to, uh, is to develop new treatment regimens for um, curing um, various forms of leishmaniasis, but in particular, the visceral forms of leishmaniasis. So these are the drugs currently used in the treatment of leishmaniasis. So sodium steep gluconate, or pentastam, which is a pentavalent antimonial compound. This was the first line drug for treatment of most forms of leishmaniasis, but especially visceral forms, for decades. Um, and it worked pretty well, still works in parts of India. And then we'll talk about drug resistance in India to this, to, to this drug. It's certainly a nasty drug, has some toxicity. Uh, 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 it's, an an, it's an antimony, and antimony in the periodic table is right above um, arsenic, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty toxic compound. Um, but but it, it has been a highly successful, relatively cheap, um, uh, 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 and, and, and effective therapeutic for treatment of most forms of Leishmanial disease for a long time. Um, amphot amphotericin, which is an antifungal drug initially, works, works pretty well. The liposomal forms, which target it to, much more effectively target it to macrophages, are, are, are much more effective than you can, you can use lower doses of amphotericin in their liposomal formulations, so there's less toxicity. Um, perimamycin, is a very effective drug. It's an aminocydine. Um, has very little toxicity, uh, but the treatment, particularly for visceral disease, is very long-term. 
Miltefacin is an oral drug, is, is the more recently developed drug for treating visceral disease. Um, it, it, it's great advantage. It was initially developed for cancer um, and was screened for its anti-leishmanial effects in vitro, was found to have powerful anti-leishmanial effects on it. I still don't think they understand how it works. This single dose of vanaxin doesn't work well at all. So they use this 17 day combination of antimony and perimomycin, and that's what they're using in Africa. Um, and um, I, I just want to say the treatment of the various forms of cutaneous leishmaniasis, there are many different treatments that are being optimized, and it depends on the species and the regions. And they still require a large randomized control of trials. Um, I want to make a point about leishmania um, and HIV co-infection. So these are the areas in which the different forms of leishmania diseases are found um, uh, in, in co-infection with, with HIV. So that includes the Indian subcontinent. Um, and HIV co-infection seriously complicates treatment. Um, so this is the relapse of this leishmaniasis over time following um, a discharge after treatment with the best drug available for treatment for this leishmaniasis, which is, uh, which is amosome, liposomal uh, amphotericin D. And 25% will relapse after uh, just Two, two or three years after therapy. Um, and in terms of uh, HIV co-infection in cutaneous disease, um, it, it, the healing um, after treatment takes much longer. It um, can take up to 15 to 20 months in these individuals that have HIV co-infection as compared to those that are HIV negative. So it really complicates treatment. Uh, so I'm going to finish up with uh, a, a quick discussion of, of this leishmaniasis system and Those colors are 
Post-Kalosar dermal leishmaniasis, um, which occurs in a certain percentage of treated individuals um, and, and involves these macular or nodular lesions that can be on the face or uh, on the trunk. Um, again, the distribution of visceral leishmaniasis. 90% um, of the global burden of visceral leishmaniasis is in just these few countries, Brazil, these countries in East Africa, and then the Indian subcontinent. And, 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 and the vast majority of infections are, in fact, in the Indian subcontinent. Um, this shows a very interesting cyclical epidemiologic pattern of visceral leishmaniasis in, in South Asia. Um, and again, the majority of these infections are, are in India. And, and it shows this cyclical pattern of, of, of infection. Um, and and these, these 12 or 13, 14 years between cycles. So it's not understand, the, the, the cyclical pattern is not understood, but, but keep it in mind, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so here we are in a trough here, we're at 2017. Um, and I, I do wanna emphasize that this is the reported cases. So it's a reportable disease, but they've done studies. Um, and the understanding is that they're reporting only um, less than 25% of the number of actual cases. So the, the real number is, is at least four times l larger. Um, this is the trend of VL cases in India and Bihar. This makes the point that the vast majority of cases in India are, are found um, in, in, in the endemic zones in, in Bihar state. Um, We're going we're gonna to talk about infection reservoirs in, in our last lecture when we talk about control efforts for this disease in India. But it, it, it's a very interesting question because it's not so clear. Who are the active reservoirs? Who, it's anthropogenic. We don't think there are non-human reservoirs. It's a question mark there. Nobody really believes that there are non-human reservoirs. They've never been identified. So it's, it's human to human flies picking up infection from a, res a human infected host and transmitting to another human. But who does it? Patients with active VL, patients with th this post uh, uh, uh PKDL, cured cases, can they still transmit? And most importantly, subclinical or asymptomatic cases. The reason they're so important is that the ratio of incident asymptomatic infection to actual symptomatic clinical disease in these different countries that have endemic VL is, um, this just makes the point, there are many more asymptomatic cases following exposure to an infected fly than symptomatic cases. So in India and Nepal, it's 8.9 to 1. So close to 10 to 1. There are 10 times more many asymptomatic cases. So the question is, they're healthy individuals. Do they carry parasites that can be transmitted back to the sand flow? Do they actually maintain the transmission cycle uh, in, in India? So we'll, we'll discuss that on the last day. Um, Sura diagnostic tests, these are really, have, have turned out to be a really important tool for um, for the epidemiology and the control effort for visceral leishmaniasis in India. So VL is associated with very high titered antibodies against the parasite. So that can, these high titered antibodies can be exploited in these really simple and pretty cheap and highly sensitive and specific serological assays. One's, one's called RK39 and one is called DAT. And these are um, these are antigens that are provi provided and then taking just tiny amounts of serum, even just from a finger stick from an infected individual, you can, you can um, get a diagnosis of, of VL based on very high titered antibodies against um, these antigens in these sera diagnostic tests. So a really important seroepidemiologic tool. Um, and P there are PCR that can also, 
be used, but it's more invasive. It requires blood or bone marrow. Um, so um, the, 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 the effort that I've been involved in for, for 20 or more years now is with Professor Shyam Sundar, who's at uh, Benares Hindu University, but the endemic zone and the place where his family is actually from is, is Muzaffarpur in Bihar. Um, and, and he has built, uh, along with others, uh, uh, a hospital that is devoted to the treatment of Kalazar patients. So this is the Kalazar treatment ward in Muzaffarpur, Bihar. This was, when, this was some years ago when the number of cases was so high I mean, they had cases in the corridors. They really did not have enough beds. This is, this is um, they're getting infusions of, of amphotericin. Um, and that is because um, antimony, which again was the first line drug, pentavalent antimony for treatment of Colazar for so many years, um, no longer was working in, the, in, in these um, the most endemic zones in Bihar. So these are the areas that um, antimony was no longer working at all. Okay. So um, they, they had to very quickly, I, this was just to make the point that a, a lot of laboratory-based studies are trying to understand the nature of drug resistance. And we can talk about that if you ha have an interest. But in, for the interest of time, I, I'm, I just want to emphasize how successful this program was to deal with this terrible problem of antimony drug resistance um, in, 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 in India, in Bihar primarily. Um, and so um, many agencies um, in, in India and the World Health Organization and, and, uh, and the Gates Foundation and One World Health stepped up to introduce as quickly as possible new drugs. Um, and, and to, to fight this disease um, and to deal with the, the, the loss of, of this frontline drug, um, stibagluconate, to treat this releishmaniasis. Um, and um, so in, within just a few years, they registered this oral drug, miltefacine. Again, a cancer drug, a repurposed cancer drug for treatment of this parasitic infection. Um, so very important. And then this amino, uh, amino glycoside, paramomycin, was registered um, just a few years after that. Highly effective for treatment of this releishmaniasis, another new drug. Um, and then um, ambisome, these liposomal formulations of amphotericin, which had always been known to be the best drug, but so frightfully expensive. One course of treatment it, it would be $1,000, um, but they negotiated um, a price reduction, which was very important, down to, I think, $50 for one course of treatment, still prohibitively expensive. Um, and very important studies that uh, Professor Sundar undertook, he showed that a single dose infusion of liposomal amphotericin was sufficient over a two-day infusion um, to, to cure this releishment analysis. Um, and then combination therapies, really important to prevent resistance. If you use two drugs instead of one, the chances of developing a resistant parasite diminishes enormously. So these combination therapies were developed. Okay, so these are the current VL treatment options based on these beautiful therapeutic trials that have taken place over the last, I guess, 15 years. Um, and and th this, was, um, th th this was such a beautifully organized effort, pretty well-funded effort, a multi-center trials to, to develop these optimal treatment options. Um, and many of them are combination treatments. Again, very important to prevent drug resistance. Um, and they've even optimized um, treatment options for VLHIV co-infections. So I will end with this very important um, effort that is ongoing that was initiated in 2005. This was a memorandum of understanding between, signed by the governments of Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. And the objective was to eliminate Kalozar, 
So not eradicate, elimination refers to less than one case per 10,000 population in these regions by 2015. So they didn't meet this 2015 milestone, but um, they've done pretty well. Um, this effort is focused on early, uh, early diagnosis and treatment. So these are the factors favoring VL elimination. Again, not eradication, elimination. Really diminishing it as an important public health problem. There's only one vector. Um, effective interventions available to interrupt transmission. These oral treatments, miltefacin, these single dose infusions of liposomal amphotericin. And in conjunction with vector control, IRS refers to indoor resid residual spraying. It has to be very comprehensive, cover all of the endemic areas, go into every household in every village. So it's very expensive, um, but the effort has been pretty well coordinated and extensive. Um, and and, um, and ha has paid off in um, a, a significant um, D diminishment in the number of endemic blocks in Bihar. Um, so these are Kelazar insulin. Again, less than one is the tar less than one per ten thousand is the target. This was two thousand and five. There were four hundred and twenty six endemic blocks. So two hundred and sixty six blocks had met this target, and there are seventy one that are between one and two and 89 that are still, um, that are still above these, these targets. Um, now, so th this seems like fantastic progress, um, but here's the caveat. There are these normal cycles, and are we just at the trough of these normal cycles? Is the reduction in the number of cases really due to this elimination effort involving diagnosis, treatment, and vector control, or was it going to happen anyhow? So we should know this within the next two, three, four years. It should start to come up again. Um, and we'll leave it at that, and I will be delighted to take any, any questions at all. Questions? Sorry. How drugs act on the body? How the mm. drugs? Yeah. So, so the mode of action of most of these drugs is so. So for for antimony, it's 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 somewhat some you know that that's the again was the first line drug. The, the uh, antimony, again, terribly toxic compound, is in a pentavalent form. It's pentavalent antimony. And it, it gets into the macrophage. Um, it's not so clear how it gets in, but the resistant, that, that, but it's converted to its trivalent form, which is the active form, um, and will, will interfere with various metabolic pathways in the parasite here. The resistance is due to the upregulation of these ABC transporters that lead to a, an, an efflux of this trivalent form from the parasite and makes it resistant. Um, Basically, kill the amastigotes. So, so it kills the amastigotes. This is the this mechanism is applicable for all drugs and only for miltefacin. Well, well, no, this is antimony. I actually I don't know how miltefacin works. I believe it works on the membrane. It, it, it causes um, disruption of, of, of membrane uh, microdomains, I think. But I, I actually, I'm, I'm not sure how miltefacin, I don't think anyone really understands how miltefacin works. Again, it was developed as a cancer drug. And aldonovane convert into the PKDL, any any reason? So antimony and no, sir. Aldonovani, Leishmania donovani patients 
converted into the post collagen dermal leishmaniasis. Then any mechanism and some genes and some cytokines and involvement in that process? Yep. Yeah, so that's a good question. So what predisposes some individuals to develop PKDL? Um, so, so it really is, is not well known. There, there were some studies in East Africa, not in, in Ethiopia, uh, Kalazar in Ethiopia, that suggested that, um, that IL-10 upregulation had some association in, in patients that develop PKDL. But, but uh, so an interesting question, is it the same parasite? That, so, so, so again, these are patients that had full-blown visceral disease. They were drug treated. Um, and they still have parasites now in their skin. Is, is that the same parasite that produced their visceral disease? And, it, and the genomic analysis seems to be yes. The parasite hasn't changed. It's the host response that has changed. I want to emphasize that all of these drugs never produce a sterile cure. And we'll discuss this in terms of the immunology. Even self-healing lesions, there's never, we don't believe that there's sterile cure. So even when there's a curative response in terms of clinical disease, these individuals still harbor some infection. So that's an important point. And e e even the most effective drugs, like liposomal amphotericin, no one believes that it produces a sterile cure. Those individuals still have some parasites and that's manifested at least in a proportion of individuals as these dermal lesions, post colazar dermal disease. Sir, uh, this is the last question. In PKDL patient, they develop immunity. Suppose if sand fly again in contact with PKDL patient, and again they sand fly in contact with healthy patient, what happens in these cases? So these PKDL patients are, have, have long thought to have been a, a critical infection reservoir. That, that, and and, and we'll, we'll show some, some, some information, new studies from, from the, 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 the BHU group uh, on the last lecture that they've actually looked at that. They have fed flies to PKDL lesions and, and they efficiently do pick up parasites from these dermal lesions. So they are an, at least one important component of maintaining the transmission cycle. The real question is, do individuals that don't have PKDL, do they, they still may have parasites in their skin, they just haven't developed a host reaction to that. But even normal skin may harbor parasites and, and after, after treatment, uh, those individuals continue to transmit infection to flies. So we'll discuss that point as well. But it is, it, it is very clear that PKDL patients are a very efficient source of infection back to the sand flies. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Sir, till date, there are so many drugs are available. As you earlier mentioned, amphotericin B, miltefosin, antimony. But we are unable to control the Leishmania parasites. So what could be the possible uh, reason behind this? Possible reason behind this? So not any vaccines comes into this field. detection and treatment but early case detection and treatment will will only work if only active cases are the reservoirs of infection if healthy people are also 
transmitting infection, then the, the, the sand flies will continue to be able to pick up parasites and maintain um, transmission cycle. So, so, so we'll address those questions in, in, in our, the last day of discussion. Um, and and uh, I, again, th that's why vaccines are always one of the most useful tools to control uh, to to control these these infections. But there are no vaccines yet for any form of leishmaniasis, including this one disease. Um, but there still may be some possibilities for vaccines, and we'll discuss that. We'll discuss why it's hard to develop vaccines, and and, and why it still may be possible. Hello, sir. I have a question. Uh, and uh, you also mentioned there are many drugs, but still there are cases of PKD. It means these uh, these drugs which are discovered, those are not as effective as they should be. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize again, the, these drugs are curative. The, in the absence of treatment, these patients would die. So, so these patients are cured and, and they be, they're healthy, but there's no sterile cure. It's not just in visceral lesionosis, but the cutaneous forms as well. There's never a complete elimination of the parasite, um, which is very interesting, very frustrating. But, but somehow these parasites manage to, to persist, perhaps in a dormant stage in some other cells, and, and we'll discuss that. But the, I, I don't want to diminish the importance of these drugs. They saved the lives of these people, because they would die without these drugs. And, and they, they're cured, and they can lead, live healthy lives. Some of them do develop PKDL. But PKDL can be treated as well. And PKDL is not a fatal form of the disease. And, and it can be treated. So, so again, the drugs are not perfect, but, but they have been, um, I, 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 I really want to emphasize that of all, all the efforts to control leishmaniasis anywhere in the world, the efforts on the Indian subcontinent to deal with antimony resistance and to quickly develop new drugs has been a fantastic effort to so, so quickly introduce three new drugs um, and drug combinations um, in, in really just 10, 10 or 12 years. It's been a very successful effort. So the same drug could be used to treat PKD as well as the previous form of the Lishmania or different? Yeah, yes, so, so miltepicin is used to treat uh, uh, PKDL and, and amphotericin is used to treat PKDL. Um, in Africa, where there is not antimony drug resistance, they still use antimony for treating VL and PKDL. Because of that, they are not getting controlled. Like, so, so I don't know much about the vector. Again, it's indoor residual s spraying with, um, uh, and I'm not sure the insecticides they use, but they're quite expensive, and um, they're they they're, you know, it it's very focalized indoor resi So they don't spray whole villages. They spray the insides of. Houses where they know the sand flies are breeding, um, but it's a huge effort, as you can imagine, and and very expensive. It very expensive. So the issue becomes: once they achieve these elimination targets, do they have to maintain the spraying? Um, do they have to do that every year? Because they couldn't possibly do that. It's much too expensive. Um, but one, once they knock the the VL incidents way down, um, 
will it come back? Um, so that's the question we're poised to have answered in the next few years. Will it start to come up again? In one slide, you showed that uh, the conversion of asymptomatic uh, disease to the symptomatic disease, uh, asymptomatic into symptomatic varies from countries to countries. Say, for example, in the Sudan, it's uh, around 3%, uh, and uh, in Spain, it's uh, around uh, 50 is to 1. So what might be the reason? Is it because of the individual's immunity or it is because of the uh, hygienic uh, foods they are taking? What might be the reason? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know really. Yeah. In Spain, 50 is to 1 and Sudan, 2.4 is to 1. Oh, Spain. A huge variation. Yeah, well, remember, that's, that's a different parasite. That's not Leishmania donomani. That's Leishmania infantum, which is an opportunistic. So, so healthy adults, they can get infected um, with Leishmania infantum, and they, they're not going to develop disease. It's only young children or immunocompromised people. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's, that's why it's so high there. Um, but, but it's more similar in the African countries and Indian and Nepal. That's Leishmania donomani. And I'm not sure how accurate those ratios because, uh, are. Uh, it's mostly seen in the uh, developed countries. The Lismanesis is mostly seen in the developed countries, having uh, poor uh, backgrounds. Yeah, I mean, visceral Lismanesis especially is a disease of poverty. Right. It's absolutely a disease of poverty. Okay, so, so, just, so tomorrow we'll, we'll discuss vector biology, how these parasites have learned to live inside of a sand fly and be transmitted by flies. And then, and then the second lecture will be on Leishmania genetics and, and, mole and molecular genetics.